forward. Think Research Channel. There's a structural problem with genocide, which is that it tends to happen in places that are off the beaten path. So now, in order to promote nonviolence and reduce violence, ultimately we have to address the motivation. Society needs to acknowledge that learning is a lifelong challenge. The sit-ins challenge cherished beliefs, most whites held dearly. At the DNA level, we're all 99.9% .9 the same. All so individuals do matter. And I think the quality of our individual leadership matters. Who is speaking for poor people? 40 million Americans make $6 an hour. Who is speaking for them? The only thing that one has after throwing everything overboard is the love that one can give. I was the first computer science graduate from the University of Virginia. Uh, I got my PhD here in 1968. And so I came back to the academy, uh, to the uh, university in 1988, 20 years later, um, after having just run about a 100 person, 120 person software company for almost a decade. And I had what some friends of mine describe as an interocular event. That's a two by four between the eyes. <laughs> um, I really realized that engineering education um, didn't have much to do with what I had experienced running a technology-based company. And moreover, it was pretty much the same education that I'd had 30 years before that. So I devoted with a, a number of my colleagues in CS about three years to revising the computer science curriculum, but frankly, I didn't do much with respect to the broader engineering uh, curriculum here at, at Virginia. When I went to the National Academy, however, I decided that I had a bigger bully pulpit and that I really ought to take advantage of that to try and have a positive impact. The fact that the number of engineering graduates has peaked in the middle 80s and, is, and has been on a downslope since um, worries me. It worries me that we are as dependent upon foreign nationals as we are, as, one, as wonderful as they are. My, my father was a, an immigrant from Germany in the 1920s, so I feel very strongly about the contributions that immigrants, immigrants make. Nonetheless, the fact that we are not able to attract U.S. students to engineering and science is something we need to be very concerned about. Uh, we are not going to be able to compete with developing countries like China and India on the basis of cost. Uh, we better do it on the basis of quality. And that's where engineering education comes in. There are going to be four parts to this talk. The uh, first one has to do with the fact that I feel a great sense of urgency about getting on with this reform. Changing universities is not an easy thing to do, but if we don't start now, it just ain't going to happen. The practice of engineering has changed enormously from what it was 40 years ago. And engineering education hasn't changed very much at all. Um, I'm hard pressed to point at a half a dozen things that are different today than when I started in, well, almost 50 years ago, 49 years ago. Um, moreover, the things that are changing about the practice of engineering, I liken to a mosaic. Uh, there are lots of little pieces changing. 
There is a pattern to that mosaic, but it's hard to see from up close. You really have to be able to stand back a long way. Uh, I really am concerned that unless we start making some important changes, we'll soon be educating engineers for the occupation that my father had as opposed to the ones that my children and grandchildren will have. So what needs to change? Well, a lot. <laughs> uh, the first thing that comes to mind always are curriculum and pedagogy. I'm going to come back and talk about curriculum a little bit later. It's the thing we get hung up on a lot, and so I don't want to waste a lot of time up front. Pedagogy. Um, an enormous amount has been learned by the cognitive scientists about both the physiological and psychological aspects of learning in the last 15 years. Engineering education has incorporated almost none of that. We could be teaching faster, more efficiently, and with better learning outcomes. We need to do that. What else needs to change? Diversity. I believe down to my toes that a diverse engineering team will build a better quality product. So in addition to the usual arguments for diversity having to do with equity, well, we Americans are pretty sensitive to arguments about fairness and equity, but in addition to that and the arguments about um, the need for well, about the fact that white males are becoming a minority, and if we don't involve women and underrepresented minorities, we're simply not going to have enough numbers of engineers. So in addition to those two arguments, I believe that there's a very important argument for engineering in particular that we will engineer better with a diverse workforce. Retention rate. It's a disgrace. Not all schools are the same, but across the United States, about half of the students who enter in engineering do not finish in engineering. Um, the ones who leave are not poor students. Very scholarly work has been done that shows that the students that leave engineering are indistinguishable from those who stay. They have the same grade point average. They have the same grades in math and science. They have the same SAT scores. They have the same rank in high school. They are not poor students. We are not weeding out the poor students. We are turning off half of our students with the way that we teach. I am concerned about both the quantity and the quality of our current engineering graduates. Uh, but the quickest way to fix the quantity problem is not to attract more people into the pipeline, not to worry about kids deciding in, in uh, uh, middle school that they don't like math. Those are problems. But have the, the uh, sorry, add 50% to the retention rate, and the problem is fixed. And we have that under our control. We can fix that. BS is the first professional degree. Most professions, business, law, medicine, assume that the first professional degree is a master's degree. In fact, in case you don't know it, according to the United States government, engineering is not a profession. The definition of profession by the Department of Commerce requires two years beyond the baccalaureate. Okay? So engineering is not a profession. The fact that we treat the bac baccalaureate uh, as, a, as a first professional degree causes all sorts of mischief. It's a misrepresentation to both students and employers. It's caused the program to bloat to a size well beyond that of our liberal arts friends. Companies generally expect that they're going to have to spend one to two years providing additional training. Um, liberal education in the humanities is squeezed out, as are social and, 
uh, management sciences that are needed by modern engineers. The problem is exacerbated by a number of states, in, including Virginia, I believe, that have consider, considered mandating that the engineering degree has to be done in 120 hours. Okay, so these problems naturally segue me into the uh, curriculum issues. Almost every time we talk about curriculum, people talk about what we need to add. Folks, we can't add anything. Okay? We have to talk about what we're going to either get rid of or what we're going to be able to do in two semesters instead of four. My favorite thing to kick is the fact that we still teach four semesters of continuous mathematics. I met with a bunch of students this morning and asked how many of them had had calculus in high school. All but one raised their hand. When I was going through engineering school, nobody had calculus in high school. And yet we still have four semesters of continuous mathematics. Irrespective of the fact that these students will probably never integrate anything <laughs> ever again. Um, this uh, pressure on adding more things to the cur curriculum always provokes somebody to utter the mantra, the undergraduate curriculum should teach only the fundamentals. The problem always is deciding what the fundamentals are. Um, the, the last major curriculum change in engineering is what is referred to as the engineering science approach following World War II. Uh, and since then, the fundamentals have pretty much been physics and continuous mathematics. But as I said earlier, engineering is changing. Very few people will produce a product in the future that doesn't have embedded IT, information technology. And yet it's discrete mathematics, not continuous mathematics, that is the basis for IT. It is as fundamental as continuous mathematics. Biological processes, materials, I think are a little bit behind IT in terms of their impact on general engineering, but I feel like they're closing fast. So the biological sciences and chemistry are also new fundamentals. Boy, am I ever sensitive to the fact that engineering is now conducted in a global context. Both the act of engineering and the customer of the product that we develop are global. Um, the engineer, contemporary engineer needs to design under constraints of global cultural issues, global business contexts, and so really must understand them at a fairly deep level. It's as fundamental as thermodynamics. We can't just add these new, new fundamentals. Our curriculum is already too full, uh, especially if we continue to claim that the baccalaureate is a professional degree. I think we have to look very carefully at the current cherished fundamentals and ask, are they? Or is there a way to teach them in half the time or a third the time? Let me talk about faculty rewards. My quick definition of what engineers do is design under constraint. We design solutions to human problems, but not any old solution will do. There are a whole bunch of constraints, everything from size, weight, power consumption, heat dissipation, to safety, reliability, manufacturability, ergonomics, environmental impact. The list of constraints is very long. Um, doing that kind of design is a highly creative activity. I don't know why, but um, frequently when people talk about engineering, they immediately jump to the math and science component. My experience, the essential characteristic of a good engineer, a great engineer, is creativity. That said, can you think of any other discipline on campus, which is a creative field, which doesn't require 
its faculty to perform. Artists must paint. They get tenure based on their paintings, not their writings. Sculptors, musicians. Even if you're not willing to buy that engineering is the same kind of creativity as that of artists, just think about the performance-oriented professions. Law, for example. Medicine, for example. You think of any creative activity which doesn't require one to perform that activity. I can't. Except for engineering, of course. Very few faculty have ever done any engineering. We do research, but producing a product, I can assure you, is a very different thing than doing research. Um, instead, we have faculty promotion and tenure criteria, which are the same as those in the sciences. Research, teaching, service. Somewhere in there, we're missing creating a product, actually doing innovation, um, creating a piece of lasting infrastructure for the country. We don't require it. Oh, I'm, I'm, what I'm criticizing is a system in engineering schools which doesn't allow for the richness of experience that comes with the actual practice of engineering. It would be very valuable to students. Technological literacy. We all love the fact that the University of Virginia was founded by Thomas Jefferson. And Jefferson was very clear about why he was proud of founding the university. He said you could not have a democracy without an educated citizenry. I think he would be concerned today. I have spent the last 11 years sitting at the nexus of engineering and public policy. And almost every day I have my nose rubbed in the fact that the people to whom I'm trying to communicate have abs are technologically illiterate. They're not dumb. They just don't understand how technology is created or how it works. And yet it is one of the strongest forces shaping our democracy, period. What bothers me is not only that our elected representatives, our appointed representatives, um, are illiterate, but also the people that elect them. The vast majority of the American public cannot participate in a intellectual discourse on a whole variety of really important public policy issues. Climate change, energy policy, I mean, the list just goes on and on. And these are, are really fundamental. And they get their the wool pulled over their eyes all the time. Not from people intentionally trying to misrepresent things, but because the speaker doesn't understand things himself. Um, three years ago in the State of the Union address, and I'm, I'm not picking on Bush here because I could do this with Democrats too, but. In the State of the Union address, uh, Bush talked about uh, the hydrogen economy and talked about, you know, you just combine hydrogen and oxygen and you get energy and water and there's no pollution. Full stop. <laughs> you know, I honestly believe he did not know that you had to manufacture hydrogen. Okay? Um, we did a report on the hydrogen economy at the academies two years ago, and um, this isn't the way the report writers would have said it, but basically the report says it, would have take, it will take about six miracles in order to convert to a hydrogen economy. Um, I mean, there's just some very difficult and deep problems that need to be solved in order to make that work. So it's my personal belief that in a modern democracy, everybody with a liberal education needs to be technologically literate. Now engineering schools have not traditionally provided courses for the liberal arts majors, but in my humble opinion, 
They must. Not should, must. They're not the kind of courses we're accustomed to teaching. Um, since they're going to relate technology to larger social issues. It just as an aside, the, the year that I went to the Academy was 1996, and just before that, the, the Academy puts out a, a quarterly magazine called The Bridge. Um, and just before I got there, an issue of The Bridge came out in which there is a description of uh, a little exercise that a man who was provost at the time at, at uh, Columbia had done scanning all of the most popular American history texts, both high school texts and college texts. And um, I'm not going to remember the numbers, so I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm making up numbers, but in something like 15,000 pages or 20,000 pages he scanned, he found like 15 or 20 that talked about technology. And yet, technology has had such a profound influence on our society. Um, some of you will know this, but the Academy, in running up to the year 2000, did a little exercise in which we assembled a list of what we said were the 20 greatest en engineering achievements of the 20th century where greatest was defined in terms of impact on society, not technological gee whiz. And, and you read that list and you can't help but be struck by how radically different our lives are from someone living in 1900. By the way, my, my grandfather was a teenager in 1900, so I feel like just two generations away. I'm an old guy, but two generations away. Um, but things like the average life expectancy in 1900 was 46. It's now north of 76, so it's increased by at least 30 years. And it's estimated that 20 of those 30 years are simply due to clean water. Just about as prosaic engineering as you can imagine. And yet, in 1900, waterborne diseases were the third leading cause of death in the United States. Um, but you can imagine the list. Electricity, or electrification, automobiles. First airplane had not flown in 1900. Uh, one of my favorites on the list is agricultural mechanization. In 1900, 50% of Americans lived on farms, including my grandfather. Uh, and it took that many to feed the other 50%. Now, because of agricultural mechanization, it's 2% live on farms. And we not only feed the rest of the United States, but a good chunk of the rest of the world as well. Why haven't things changed faster? I don't know, but I have an hypothesis. Uh, the hypothesis is simply that most faculty don't believe the change is necessary. They're following the old wise adage, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If you haven't had recent experience in industry, which I don't think most faculty have, and if change is a mosaic in multiple dimension, whose patterns are hard to discern, then the fact that it's broke may not be obvious. Uh, it's my belief that if the NAE consistently asserts that it believes the change is necessary and exhibits the fact that it values people who cause that change, then over time, faculty attitudes will change. And so what we have is what's been called Bill's four-legged stool. Um, leg number one of the stool is we did what we always do. We created a committee. Um, it's called the Committee on Engineering Education. Like all the other committees we have, they produce reports. And many of you, I'm sure, have seen the Engineer of 2020 and educating the Engineer of 2020. Um, second, we said, if we're going to assert that engineering education is important, we better not say, oh, but it's not important enough to let you get elected to the academy. So we've changed the rules. You can now be elected to the academy for contributions to engineering education. And people have been. Um, that's not just being a good teacher. 
Okay? It's really having a, a national impact on engineering enterprise. Third leg of the stool, we have created a $500,000 prize that's given annually for contributions to engineering education. Uh, I believe we've given the fifth, fourth or fifth of those just last Tuesday. It's called the Gordon Prize. And finally, we reversed our field. I said at the beginning, we don't do anything. We just advise other people to do something. Well, we have created something called the Center for the Advancement of Scholarship on Engineering Education at the academies, which is an active entity. It's uh, got a budget of about $4 million this year, and it's trying to promote increased quality of the scholarship on engineering education and broader dissemination of the results that we found. Um, so let me conclude. Our society, in my view, is not only dependent upon technology, it's become addicted to technological change. If you ask most people about the important events of the 20th century, they'll talk about World War I and II, the Great Depression, things like that, maybe the Cold War. I think those things all pale in comparison to what engineering has contributed. But engineering is changing. It's not the same discipline that it was 50 years ago. And engineering has to change, engineering education has to change, not just to keep up with that, but actually to lead it. Um, the global competitive landscape is changing at the same time. And if you don't buy the argument about um, my simple assertion that engineering, uh, engineering is changing, therefore engineering education is changing, uh, pay close attention to the fact that we are going to be in competition with very good engineers from places like India and China. Uh, they've got big populations. They're taking the top people. They're very smart. Um, their universities are it's scary. Um, you go to places like Tsinghua in Beijing and everything is new. There isn't an old piece of equipment anywhere in the place. Um, I go to MIT and I look at the same laboratories and I see a lot of 20 and 30 year old equipment. Uh, moreover, their work ethic is unbelievable. And so we had better change. Okay, that's it.